when should we be pairing our calves? The literature is pretty clear from a nutritional benefit perspective. So there's quite a bit of literature out there that shows that calves will eat starter sooner if they're paired with a buddy. And they will also eat more grain if they're paired with a buddy, which reflects in better growth. However, you only get those benefits, one, if you pair them in a very close age. So they need to be no more than two weeks apart in age. And they need to be paired really early in life. So most veterinarians, according to actually Van Oss, her she has a survey that just recently came out that shows that veterinarians prefer you to, per, to pair those calves before they're at least seven days of age. And actually, that's when the literature shows the nutritional benefits to really be there. There's something about early life finding starter together that really helps these calves take off and do better than individually housed calves. <laughs> everyone, this is Luis Ferreiro, one of the hosts of the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt podcast. And today we have the opportunity to discuss with Dr. Melissa Cantor about calf nutrition, calf pairing, and a lot of other things associated with that. Uh, Melissa is with the Penn State University. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, could you please give us a brief background about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously I'm Melissa Cantor. I grew up in Southern California, just one dairy in the entire county where I grew up actually. Uh, but I grew up with racehorses and thought that that was going to be my calling. But as we all know, we don't all end up veterinarians. <laughs> so I ended up changing my career. I worked with some dairy folks uh, at the University of Kentucky. I did a little internship there and I fell in love with the dairy industry. And I really never looked back after that. I actually spent some time in Madison. That's where I did my master's degree at UW. And I came back to Kentucky for my Ph.D., then went to Guelph for a, for a postdoc in population health medicine stuff about veterinary. And now here I am at Penn State in Pennsylvania. So very excited to not be freezing in Canada anymore. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, those winters are always tough and I think everybody will agree to it. So, but, you know, going back to, to our discussion, I have a, a question that I think a lot of people have a lot of interest learning about. Uh, Basically, more and more we see the importance of pair housing for calves and how that helps them to not only adjust to weaning, but become more competitive later on when they are exposed to a feed bunk uh, type of environment. But from a nutritional uh, or nutrition perspective, what can we do or what do we have to do to make sure we are actually successful in establishing this practice on a dairy farm? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Farmers like to ask me that as well. Like, when should we be pairing our calves? The literature is pretty clear from a nutritional benefit perspective. So there's quite a bit of literature out there that shows that calves will eat starter sooner if they're paired with a buddy. And they will also eat more grain if they're paired with a buddy, which reflects in better growth. However, you only get those benefits, one, if you pair them in a very close age. So they need to be no more than two weeks apart in age and they need to be paired really early in life. So most veterinarians, according to actually Van Oss, her, she has a survey that just recently came out that shows that veterinarians prefer you to, per, to pair those calves before they're at least seven days of age. And actually that's when the literature shows the nutritional benefits to really be there. There's something about early life finding starter together that really helps these calves take off and do better than individually housed calves. So that's, that's, that's a huge nutritional component. And then obviously you have to feed at least seven and a half liters a day. I, I say seven because that's the bare minimum, but seven and a half is probably better to get the growth benefits. All right. Yeah. All great uh, insights associated with that. So you mentioned a little bit the early life of the calf and how important it is to maybe start pairing then uh, a little bit earlier, like less than seven days and so on. Uh, if we go back some steps, there is some recent evidence about the benefits of colostrum beyond the initial 24 hours of life. Can you tell us a bit more about the research topic? Uh, and what is the summary on what we know so far about extended or intervention feeding colostrum to calves? That's a very complex question to answer in a short amount of time, so I'm gonna do my best. Um, so really, we know that calves get a lot of diarrhea and or scours, same thing, but different term. 
really early in life, right? We're talking seven days to 21 days of age being that risk period. Day 10 being when most calves get scours and every farmer knows about that. There's actually quite a bit of literature coming out now, especially from the University of Guelph, that shows that if you intervene with those calves right when they start that episode of diarrhea with a bottle of colostrum, you can actually lower the severity of it. So they're sick for less time and they actually grow better. And that would be on individually housed calves offered six liters a day. Nobody has actually looked at that in pair housing yet. Um, obviously it's really hard, right? To make sure that you're doing things at the pen level, uh, but certainly it needs to be explored. But it does seem that when you actually intervene, when they get sick, colostrum helps ameliorate that. Similarly, if you're trying to feed like a transition milk plan, and a lot of calf ranches are starting to think about doing this now. So you have your traditional more limit fed diet, six liters a day, trying to wean those calves really early. In that scenario, it actually helps to give them colostrum when they're healthy. So some ranches will give it at arrival. Others will feed it just a small amount, one liter a day for 125 grams in that liter across several days. And the literature from Mike Steele's lab in that aspect has found that extended feeding actually lowers the risk of dying if you're in a high disease pressure environment. So there are some real benefits to colostrum feeding. And I could go on forever on that topic. We could talk a long time. We don't know why. We don't know what's going on in the colostrum to make that happen. Well, but regardless, it's a very it's a very important topic, right? Because in addition to show that uh, basically uh, it could have benefits, it also reinforces the importance of have a very good colostrum management, right? So we can actually have colostrum available uh, for this extra feeding, if you will, right? So certainly something that their producers have to take into uh, consideration and make sure everything works quite well. But if we go back a little bit to the socially housed calves uh, or paired uh, calves, so hay is often discouraged, right, for pre-weaned calves because of the potential limitations on intake uh, of starter, right? Uh, but are there any other benefits for the uh, pair house calves uh, when feeding hay. Can you tell us more about your perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, my master's student just completed a project. The idea behind it is to discourage cross-sucking because these pair house calves do tend to suck on each other. They spend a couple minutes a day doing that. It's a very undesirable behavior for obvious reasons. But what we didn't expect is I really did it for the behavior aspect. I did, I did all the nutrition as well, dry matter intake, feed efficiency, and growth, I was shocked to see that it actually resulted in bigger calves. So we were seeing that um, these calves who finished the study at day 70, they were weaned at day 62. These calves, for some reason, are four kilograms bigger than the controls, and their dry matter intake did, did not differ. So I'm not sure what the reason is. There's probably a trade-off of some calf starter. Obviously, there's the there's a potential that this could have a negative effect on rumen development, right? So there needs to be more research, but I can tell you that you can see which animals those are. When you go out to the wean barn, there's a pretty big stature difference between them. Um, and, and again, I haven't done the results yet for cross-sucking, so we'll still have to dig into that to let you know, because I was more interested in does it stop the undesirable behavior by giving the calf effective fiber. No, absolutely. And I think it's great when we kind of challenge some of those, uh, I'm going to say old, but very well known concepts, right? Because especially as the industry uh, changes, like for example, here using pair housing instead of individually uh, house calves, we certainly have to kind of uh, learn everything from scratch again, right? So I think it's great that you're testing that. And we are really looking forward to see some of this data whenever you have it uh, ready to go. Yeah, it should be ready soon. Um, my grad student needs to finish the manuscript. We're getting there. <laughs> but no pressure, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and also, I should specify that was Timothy Hay. We, we, we didn't, we know that alfalfa compromises dry matter and take a calf starter. So this was not some super high protein, high quality hay. So I just want to throw that out there. 
Oh, so that's a very great insight. So if fitting A, probably we should focus on slightly lower quality than alfalfa in yes. general. Yep, that's a great insight yeah, exactly. as well. So I know that you work a lot in extension uh, and obviously often visit dairy farms. So what are some of the nutrition related things that you experience uh, that you think would be helpful uh, to remind dairy producers about? Yeah, absolutely. So offer fresh water to your calves. I know that that is just such an obvious low hanging fruit. And I know every nutritionist is already telling their farmer to do that, but you'd be surprised how often people say they're offering fresh water to their calves and the calves don't have fresh water. Um, so that's a big one. Um, and also when you're having a disease outbreak too, the water oftentimes can be a contributor. So I do a lot of sanitation audits on farms with ATP meters. There are these little devices that measure how much living material is in a substance. So they're great for seeing how well we clean, how well we sanitize. And I can't tell you how often the waters they think are being cleaned aren't. Um, so just keep that in mind that water actually matters more than we think. And if you're big digging your head at nutrition and everything seems fine, but the calves don't look good, test the water because that oftentimes has a lot of things going on nutritionally. We just don't think about it, but it really does play a major role in how our calves grow and how much intake they have. Absolutely. This is also true for dairy cows. Certainly fresh water at all times is key and we should never underlook that. Uh, that issue. If we change topics a little bit, obviously uh, there is a good amount of research related to what are the key feeding strategies uh, for calves with robotic milk feeders, uh, but what are some of the current research that you are looking at with this new technology? Yeah, so thanks for asking about that. So there's there's so many questions. We know quite a bit about calf feeders now, right? We know that if you put them on the feeder, they have to be offered a, a decent amount of milk. We can't go we can't go conventional feeding on that plan to get them on grain. And we also know we can slowly wean them across time. There's pretty good evidence from UBC about that and from the the Europe in general. But what we don't understand quite yet is how to use this data to predict who's going to be successful and who's not. Um, so right now I'm following a huge group of 2,500 beef on dairy calves, and we're trying to figure that out. Can we predict which calves based on milk intake, which calves are going to be the ones that grow really well? Is there a behavioral pattern that indicates a calf that's not going to do well? Can we predict disease? So we're currently following a huge group of calves where we have every single little bit. The nutritionist is very involved with that trial. I'm not the nutritionist for that farm. So it's really exciting because we're even trying different diets too to see how that impacts. And one's a high fat diet, um, closer to whole milk. So it's really high on the on the fat and then the other one's more of a conventional 2020 just trying to kind of figure out how do we make these animals thrive in that environment it doesn't have to be this hard to keep cows pregnant at virtus nutrition we understand the negative impact that lost pregnancies have on a dairy's economics every failed pregnancy means more money spent on expensive semen additional replacements to raise and fewer valuable beef calves to sell feed what embryos need strata with epa dha the pregnancy nutrient. Oh yeah, no, I think that's awesome. Uh, certainly beef on dairy is one of the uh, key uh, new research topics that we have going on. Uh, well, very much across the United States, right? I yeah. think there's a lot we still have to learn. And I think there are a lot of great efforts going on. So I'm very happy that you are working on that. So, so if you allow me, tell us a little bit more about the potential long-term effects of the early life disease on the lifetime performance of uh, beef dairy cross calves. What, what can you tell us about that? No, oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, so we just followed a huge cohort. This is a separate study. So that other study is in England. This one is just down the street in Pennsylvania, a bunch of Amish farmers. So we're a unique dairy industry in that we have a lot of more small to medium-sized dairies still. So we have a lot of Amish calf raisers that raise the calves, very conventional, six liters a day, wean them soon. So I basically fed them the absolute basic 
plan that you could get away with for nasum, um, and then wean those calves at right around 56 days of age, and then followed them all the way out until 283 days. Actually, we followed them through slaughter, but that work is not completely done yet. But basically what we found is that calves that have lung consolidation at weaning, so three centimeters of consolidation, have compromised growth for about 21 days after that. And then they have a compensatory phase where they're no different from the control healthy animals by the time they get to that 283 day phase. And what's really interesting too, is that we're also seeing that those animals that had that issue at weaning actually have compromised marbling at slaughter. And that's very pre preliminary data. Um, so we're still kind of teasing through that. And that paper is probably not going to be out for another six, seven months. But the one, the other paper is in review at JDS. So it's going to be here soon. Um, but it's just crazy to think that pneumonia has that level of an impact on these animals we're paying $800 to $1,000 for. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think it kind of highlights that regardless if you are working with dairy heifers or uh, beef dairy cross calves, we have to pay very close attention because it certainly will have monetary implications uh, for the producer and obviously welfare implications for those animals that we have to pay very close attention to. And I think that nowadays, pretty much everything we are doing in the field is still based on uh, field experience, right? Because it's a brand new field of research, but I'm, I'm very glad you are working on that and shed some light into the, uh, the way we actually have to handle those calves. This is very interesting stuff and crazy how much they're worth. I, I'm not doing another trial this next year because I I can't afford it. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and I and I don't think we'll get cheaper. So uh, you know, but uh, regardless, uh, whenever we have the chance to continue those studies, I think we certainly will will be very happy to learn more about and uh, uh, and so on. So Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate all the insights. I'm sure everybody at home. Uh, we'll have a blast uh, learning more about all those different topics that we discuss. Uh, thank you at home for joining the podcast today, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And also, thank you to JBS for sponsoring that beef on dairy study. I feel, like, I feel like I should acknowledge the industry support for that research. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. We are always searching for the latest and greatest research to share weekly. If you have a dairy nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details of your research to hello at wisenetics.com. Thank you and hope to see you soon.